Hi, 3D MJers. This is Andrea Valdez, and you are listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. This week is another very special interview episode with myself and coach Brad Loomis. In this episode, we talk about his background as a stock car racer, how he got into lifting, how he went from owning his own gym to becoming a personal trainer to being a part of 3D Muscle Journey, his background being coached by Skip LaCour and how that's influenced his work today. And we end with a pretty lengthy discussion on how he may or may not compete in bodybuilding again and what is the one thing that would bring him back to the sport. So stick around to the end. I think you guys will find this very fascinating as we learn more about Coach Brad Loomis. Okay, we're here with Brad Loomis for this week's little uh, 3DMJ Origins type of thing. Tell us uh, where you are right now in your career as an athlete and a coach. What are we doing right now, Brad? Um, right now as a coach, I'm probably at my all time, you know, most enjoyable and most efficient place. I really feel like, um, I'm doing my athletes the most service. I'm feeling like I can, um, really do a good job with a lot of athletes because my efficiency, it seems to be at an all time high. And, um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really enjoying the coaching process. I really am. And I don't think, I mean, we've done this now for what, five, five or six years. And I don't think I've ever had this much fun doing it. It's, awesome. it's very low stress. Um, it's, it's, I'm very efficient and I feel like I'm getting, you know, really good coaching service to my clients. So that's, that's coaching in a nutshell, really. Um, competitive aspirations now really natural bodybuilding is kind of on a hold. Um, I'm really enjoying powerlifting and I'm enjoying being strong and I don't think I've ever enjoyed training as much as I am right now. And it's, it's one of those things where it's an evolution. You know, you, you, when you're a young, uh, bodybuilder slash just weight trainer, you're always wanting to, um, lift heavier. You always wanted to lift heavier, lift heavier, lift heavier. And, and I went through a, a, a process probably about a year and a half ago where I didn't want to lift lighter weight. If I couldn't lift heavy, I wasn't going to do it. And now I'm at that point in my career where even light is for most people considered heavy. And so I'm really enjoying my training. So it, naturally it's kind of a natural evolution when you're enjoying being strong and you're enjoying progression. Um, I'm really enjoying powerlifting and I mean, let's face it. I don't have the best of physiques. You know, I got this wide waist that's 31 Me inches too, around, but I'm a girl. You know? It's even worse. <laughs> yeah. And I've got, just got bad aesthetics, you know? So why, why should I go through all of that effort to get all shredded, you know, and get all lean, uh, get up on stage with elite bodybuilders like Jeff Alberts and Alberto Nunez and, you know, the like, and, basically know that I'm going to probably be last or second to last mm -hmm. when I can, you know, is easily just go to a powerlifting competition, compete against guys that are my weight, my age, um, you know, similar strength levels. And I'm probably going to compete pretty darn well. So that's where I'm at right now is really enjoying strength sports and enjoying powerlifting. And Does that I really, mean I'll body build again, only time will tell. <laughs> yeah. And I want to get into, uh, in a couple minutes, like where it all, all started, but just to give people context to elaborate on on that for where you are now, which you seem to to not – I'm going to speak for you and like – but you, you say you're on stage with the elites. It's because you are a professional bodybuilder. And as far as the platform goes, pound for pound out of the five of us, you are the best lifter. And you did, what, third at nationals? Well, third until the drug test came back. Oh, yeah. So really second. It's second right. is where I ended up my, with my official place. So don't yes. be humble. This is your episode, man. Tell us all about it. So, yeah, we'll get there, too. <laughs> so I just want everyone to know that it's not like, well, I don't know if I'll compete. It's like, well, let's, uh, let's start from the beginning as, as to how, how it all got there. So I know right now, also, just to give us all a good picture of the current, we're in Portola, California. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. with the family and all that jazz. Um and so I just want to talk about the very beginning. Is that okay? Yeah. No, that's okay. fine. That's, Perfect. This is kind of where it all began was, you know, in this house. Well, uh, where, where are you from, from though? Where, where were you where born? Were you yeah. Yeah. Let's I go there. Born in a little town called Klamath Falls, Oregon. Okay. Uh, it's in Oregon, right almost on the California, um, 
Oregon border. And really, to be honest with you, I was not an athlete in, in high school. I really wasn't. Um, I dabbled in it, but I never was really good enough to, you know, make the, the varsity squad and make the, the a, a, a group, you know, with the wrestlers and stuff like that. I, I always wanted to be an athlete. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a pretty good sized school with a, a lot of really good athletes. And so I just, you know, I'm a competitive guy. And if I couldn't be competitive and if I couldn't be one of the best, I, I didn't really want to do it. Plus, I was kind of shy, you know, okay. and I was. The things that I really loved, and I regret it now, to be honest with you, but the things I really loved, I didn't do because I was shy and because I was afraid that I was not going to be, you know, one of the better athletes. Um, Did you have siblings or do you have siblings? I do. I've got a, a younger sister and a younger brother. Okay. Um, but my younger sister, she was in cheer. She didn't really do competitive sports per se, but she was in, she was in cheer. And then my brother, he was an athlete. He played football. He wrestled. You know, he did all the things that I wanted to do. Um, but it wasn't really until probably it was it was a while. It was a while. I didn't really start getting into athletics until probably my late twenties, really. Really? Uh, okay. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. What were and, your hobbies until then? Uh, well <laughs> <laughs> Oh I Lord. Was very, very heavily into stock car racing. Very heavily into stock car racing. Okay. Uh, not exactly an, an athletic endeavor, but it was kind of my first love. And a competitive and, endeavor, though. Yeah, yeah, it was a competitive endeavor. I started racing when I was 16 years old, um, and that kind of took my competitive aspirations. So all that stuff that I wanted to do in high school, um, you know, that was kind of like that, the, the love for that competitive experience was diverted to, to auto racing. And I kind of fell into a good opportunity where I, I got all of my gear, all of my, 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 my car, my, you know, everything that goes with racing, fire suit, helmet, tires, wheels, racing gas, everything was sponsored to me. Wow. Yeah. It was a, a, a it was, it was, it was dumb luck. I, my dad's boss was in love with it. Didn't want to race himself, but he wanted to, to field a t team. And he actually fielded, I think, three or four of us together. Uh, where, where did you compete? Like, just locally or? Or get, get up in Oregon where I went to school. Okay. And, um, and yeah, I fell in love with it. Uh, raced two years in what's called the street stock class, which is basically you take a, a street car, cut the roof off of it, and put a cage in it. Oh, uh, <laughs> pop up motor, you know, put some wide tires on it, go out and race. Um. And then once we kind of branched off and, and my sponsor went one way and I went the other way, I just started kind of footing the bill myself. And I probably did that for, I think I did that from 1988 until 19, when I graduated from college, which was 1990, I guess it was one year short. So 1992 is when I, when I stopped racing in Oregon. Okay. Uh, then I graduated college, got my x-ray license moved to Southern California, started racing there in, in kind of the local circuit there in, in uh, Blythe, California, Lake Havasu, Arizona, a um, little bit, you know, higher, more competitive class, a little more speed involved. And I did that up until 1998. And then um, 1998 was probably probably about the time when I just wasn't doing anything. You know, I got out of racing because it got too expensive. Um, yeah, I probably went through about two years where I really didn't do much of anything except work. Okay. And then I think I started picking up lifting about three years later in 2001. How'd that happen? You just decided I want to... It was, yeah, yeah, it was kind of a combination of things. I, I kind of felt tired of, of sitting on my butt and playing video games <laughs> until three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't married yet? So you weren't married yet? No, we were married. We okay. were married. We okay. got married my let's see we got married in 96 so i was still racing when we got married in fact my wife really loved kind of being part of that whole <laughs> how did you meet thing. jamie if you don't mind i asking. met her down in life that's where my first x-ray job was okay um but you got to kind of there's that gap there kind of i guess between when i moved from oregon yeah uh, and picked in southern california when i got my first job that was i mean my, my first time on my own really uh -huh. uh, i lived at home until i was 20 I think I was 22 
when okay. I finally like, you know, kind of fled the nest. The coop. Moved to California. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, met Jamie. Um, started racing again. Um, we got married, and then we moved up here to Portola, California, which is where we've been basically ever since. Was that for the X-ray job that you have now? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Not not the X-ray job I have now, but an X-ray job. Okay. Yeah. As a manager, I was managing a, a imaging department, and it was good money. You know, I couldn't uh, I couldn't turn down the offer. Put it that way. Moving okay. to this little town. <laughs> um, and then yeah, we raced up here for a good two three years, just locally, Sacramento, Roseville, Carson City, um, until '98 when I kind of had that hiatus of kind of being fat and out of shape. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you just because I forget you owned that gym. That's right, huh? Correct, so, correct. so we just started lifting, ended up owning a gym. How did, uh, how did all that come about? About the time that I thought I was going to get off my butt, I was diagnosed <laughs> with a, a, a spine abnormality. That's right. Um, okay. I thought it was from, from lifting a, a patient. I had a patient that I was helping onto the ultrasound table, and they almost fell, and I caught him mm-hmm. and injured my back. And so I thought that was what it was attributed to. Well, come to find out, I was born with a spina bifida. My vertebrae never closed all the way in the back. And, um, yeah, I have a host of, of spine problems and didn't know about it until this, this injury occurred and it kind of all came to fruition. So not long after that, I was kind of wanting to get off my butt anyway. And I was like, gosh, I need to do something to thwart future back problems. Mm-hmm. You know, cause I've got this crooked back. One vertebrae is slipped on top of the other one. They don't stack up straight. One slipped way forward cause the back never closed. And we have videos on YouTube, what- right? Of your like x-rays and everything. Yeah. How crooked it is and the offset and everything. Mm-hmm. And that was when I really started getting into lifting, really started getting into lifting heavy. Um, and it was, I think in 2001, I was still working in, in the hospital. I was still managing the x-ray department. And this lady overheard me talking to somebody about, about weight training. And she goes, you know what? You've, you've missed your calling. You, you need to quit doing this x-ray thing and you need to, <laughs> you need to start training people. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said that makes a I lot started. of sense. Okay. That was when I started the gym. There was a local gym here in town and, uh, we took out a second on the house and I bought it and we ran with it from 2000 and I think we started it in 2002 and I ran it until 2013, something like that. Did you always want to, when you started lifting, was it with uh, competitions in mind or was it just recreational because I don't want to be a lazy ass kind of thing? Yeah, pretty much. I I don't want to be a lazy ass and (laughs) I I got these back issues. You know, I got these back issues that I, that most people that have my, my abnormality need surgery. They need to actually go in there and straighten the vertebrae back up and then put hardware in to keep them straight and then lock them in and put screws in and whatnot. And I didn't want that. I really didn't want that. And so, yeah, and, and in fact, I remember vividly um, doing some training with a, a doctor friend of mine, and, and she asked me, she goes, are you going to get into bodybuilding? I was like, no, I'm not doing that ever. <laughs> well, never say ever. <laughs> How it funny. It was years later that it was 2003 was my first competition, and um, I really don't know what turned me on about it, to be honest with you. I don't really know why I wanted to do it, but I did. How did you yeah. learn? Um, like when you said that an X-ray tech was like, "Man, you should you you teach this really well. You should train people." How did you learn um, up to then? I mean, because this is like pre, you know, Instagram and bodybuilding coaching online and all that stuff. What was your main source of information that made you so good that people were like, "Oh, you should be a trainer"? Well, I, I'm. I think probably first of all, I just I think I'm a natural coach. To be honest with you, right? Um, I I don't know if it's just how I talk or how I'm able to put it in a person's language, you know what I mean? So that they understand it. But I mean, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's coaching here or training people in a gym, people just all the time tell me I I have this natural communicating ability. I remember when Xander was little, he was like six or seven years old. I was coaching his soccer team. Mm -hmm. And this lady comes up to me that was, she was not even a mom. She took her like granddaughter to the soccer practice or the soccer game or something like that. She goes, man, those kids respond to you really well. You just, you fit the bill. You're, you're a nanos. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably my biggest qualification is that, um, yeah, I just, I, I, I can somehow relate to people and I can coach them really well and put the, 
but whatever that it is that I'm coaching them uh, with in the context that they can understand it. Where and do you think that comes from? Like, was know. that when you were growing up the same way or was it not until you start working with patients maybe? Maybe. Yeah. I don't really know. I don't really know. I, I, I enjoy it. I know yeah. that. And you're good at it. And so maybe that's, it's just kind of been a, a, an evolution where it's, it started with something that I enjoy and I've just kind of gotten good at. But, you know, even my coworkers in, in, in Renown, they're like, you know, the, your patients respond to you so well, you know, and, and when they, they call me the kid whisperer, you know, the kid <laughs> fix. They're the hardest to cat scan because they're scared. I bet. On, I can all, 90% of the time I can get the cat scan on them. So when there's, when, when Brad's on and there's a two to a six year old, they call the kid whisperer. And then I go over and am able to, <laughs> to coach them, you know, onto the cat scan table and get their picture. That's but, awesome. um, yeah, outside of that, I was, uh, um, coached online by a, a gentleman by the name of Skip LaCour and learned the maximum overload style of training. It's called maximum overload training. Yeah. And took their course and I went through it, gosh, I don't know, probably three times. And that's how I trained everybody was maximum overload training. I taught them the basic, you know, technique of, of lifting, whether it's, you know, squat, deadlift, bench press, whatever. And I just trained everybody in that principle. And, you know, with maximum overload training, there is a good progression. There's a good progression plan in place. Now, granted, it's, it's not um, quite as good knowing what we know now, you know, with periodization and whatnot, but it was still a good progression plan, and uh, it was a way of progressing, and people always responded to it really well. Um, and so, yeah, with the gym and, and my ability to coach and knowing what I knew about the maximum overload training principles, I was able to, to coach people through the, you know, and train people through the gym. Right. And how did... Um... When you said Skip coached you, was that into your first show? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it was kind of one of those things where uh, it was really kind of all on me, more so than like the, the coaching relationship that we're used to. Right. You know, he would he would um, email me every now and then, you know, put out a bunch of stuff and I would follow it. Um, and it really wasn't until like, and, and keep in mind, you know, I... I paid him very little. I was basically <laughs> a member of his subscribers only oh, side or members only. Okay. So it was like a membership group. Kind of. Yep. Okay. Okay. Kind okay, of, okay. Yeah. And this was in the infancy. This is when internet was really, really in its infancy. You know what I mean? 2002? And, um, 98, oh. 99, 2000, 2001, all in that kind of time period. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I kind of went went through the members only group with the maximum overload training and everything that Skip was doing, and um, it really wasn't until um, my phone is dying. I better plug it in. It really wasn't until, gosh, it was like a week or two before my competition when I actually talked to Skip. Oh wow! And we had a phone interview, and he talked to me about Peak Week, and um, and yeah, that was like our our our. Peak week, setting up peak week was really our only real interactive coaching experience like we're used to. That is crazy. So how did you, um, tell me about that first season. So it was just you kind of navigating your own, like, all right, I guess I'll just eat less until I'm shredded. Or how did that whole thing go? Yeah, it was, um, it was very bro to say the least. <laughs> very bro. Yeah. Um, and it was just your basic, you know, just always diving down deeper and deeper and deeper, lower, lower, lower calories, eliminating foods, you know, eating a menu, you know, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So what, so, what, uh, what was your first show? Where was it there in Portola ish? Was it a big show? Did tell me about it that. was, it was, uh, it was an, a, an INBA show that okay. was in Reno, Nevada. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and like I said, this was 2003. So, I mean, we, we had the internet, but we didn't have Instagram. We didn't have <laughs> all these, you know, all these natural bodybuilding sites. I didn't even have a show picked out when I started. I didn't know where I was going to compete. Uh, I just knew I was going to do it. You know what okay. I mean? And it was kind of one of those things where, you know, I was, a, I was a member of Skip's members only site. I followed his journal. And so <laughs> I did what he did. <laughs> I saw his menu. I saw how he did things. And so I just adopted it for okay. myself. I made my own menu. 
you know, one week he would post up that they're taking away a, a, a half of a scoop of VP2 from this meal and they're cutting down from from six ounces of chicken on this meal, you know, to four ounces. And so I did the same thing. Oh, my God. And funny. that was pretty much, you know, how my my navigation went all the while using the maximum maximum overload principles, never going above six reps, mm-hmm. uh, always really heavy, you know, Um and so, yeah, probably about, I started like, it was like New Year's resolution. I'm doing this. Okay. okay? And um, just started going. And so I started researching different shows. And of course, at that time, nobody really knew about natural bodybuilding, you know, right. in, in 2000, I guess that was 2003. Um, and, and, and Skip and, and the guys that I followed, it was always, you know, NPC, Muscle Mania, you know, things like that. And... Uh, I don't even remember how I managed to stumble upon it, but I stumbled it upon naturalbodybuilding.com, which okay. is the site for INBA slash PNBA. Mm-hmm. And I found a, a, a natural bodybuilding show in Reno. And it was, I think it was like June or something like that. Um, and so then it was like, ah, I know where I'm going to compete. You know, I've got this place picked out, you know, and I didn't know anybody that was going to be there. You know, I didn't know anything. You know, I was just basically knowing that I was going to do my damnedest to show up there just <laughs> shredded, you know. And, and did you? And, and com- were you shredded? I did. I okay, did. you yeah, were I, I was, it was a very good feeling. That was, I remember that day famously. <laughs> <laughs> how did you, how did you place? What did you learn? Like, was it like, all right, I did awesome and I'm going to do a season or was it like, I've, or was that the only show that you did and then you went into a dark place? Like, that, how was it? It was the only show I did that year. Okay. Uh, I, I came into that show not really knowing what to expect. And in fact, really, to be honest with you, I was standing in the line of guys. There was like seven or eight of us and we're all clothed and everything. And, you know, I was this skinny dude in clothes, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, with my, my AST t-shirt. And, and these guys were huge, you know. And I was like this far from just saying, screw it. I, I've been dieting for, for six years. I am dying for a pizza. I'm just going to eat. <laughs> and I was ready to just say, screw it. I'm just, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to win this. You know uh-huh. what I mean? These guys are huge. Um, but I don't even know exactly what I just, I said to myself, no, you know what? You're going to finish this out. You've done this for six months. You've got a plan. You and Skip laid it out. We're just going to follow it and we're going to finish it out. I mean, it's, it's, 12 hours for crying out loud. You can stuck it up for 12 yeah. hours. And so um, they start the show and, 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 you know, it was, INBA is kind of different, you know, they kind of like, they show up with all their carts and boom, there's the trophies and they start hanging banners and everything. And you're kind of thinking to yourself, gosh, I, I prepared six months for this, you know, <laughs> this place isn't even ready yet. They're setting it up <laughs> uh, as we're having our meeting. Um, and so I, we're backstage and they've started all the other classes, you know, the teens and everything. I was nervous. So I'm practicing my posing. I didn't pump up or anything. I'm just back there practicing my posing. And I hear them out there. They're saying, the judge is saying, okay, side chest. And so I would hit my side chest, hold it, you know what I mean? And then say, relax. And then I would relax, you know. And as I'm practicing my posing, people are, I didn't even pick up on it because I was oblivious. And People are just looking at me and I'm like, they just think I'm weird because I'm, I'm posing to these, to the judge on stage. You know, they just think I'm weird, but they were just looking at me and looking at me. And so finally we get up on stage, do our thing. I have no idea about bodybuilding. They they position me in the middle. I'm always in the middle. And we go through our whole thing and we come off stage and I mean, boom, there's people on me. How the hell did you get so credit? (laughs) <laughs> this one guy that ends up now is one of my best friends. He comes up to me and he says, you've got lines in your glutes. I have never seen that before except with with steroid users. Mm-hmm. You know, with, we've never seen that ever. And this guy is a professional photographer and he, he's already, I'm going to take pictures of you. I'm going to take you out and we're going to go ahead and do this modeling shoot thing. And I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> I could not get over the attention that I was. So yeah. Yeah, I was in the novice. I won the novice overall. All right. Um, did a, a, a second category, won that one as well. And um, yeah, after that, I was hooked. That was my first experience is, you know, having this, this jaw-dropping 
look on everybody's face. Some of the gals were just like, did you just indi- just diet for an entire year? I'm like. <laughs> How funny. That was my very first show in 2003 with the IBA in Reno, Nevada. And uh, so after that, you went and ate all the foods or whatever. Was it a good experience uh, between like the next season? I know for myself and like Eric talked about it too, like after the first one, there there was like a a real a lot of healing emotionally and mentally that had to come. Were you just like, all right, let's do it again in a year or two or whatever? Like, how is your your lull in between seasons, and when was the next one? Yeah, that's you know that's a good question because I had a, a it was a harsh prep for me. I remember feeling like just poop, you know. <laughs> uh, it, I, I remember vividly just walking down because I owned the gym and it was right down the road here. Mm-hmm. And I remember chanting as I'm walking down there to do my cardio, you know. I, I, let's see if I can remember what the chant was. It was something like, <laughs> it's not the biggest, and, it's not the big, it, the winner is not the biggest and strongest man. The winner is the man that believes he can. I'm chanting that <laughs> all the way down there. My legs are just heavy and fried. And the cardio that, did with the 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 approach was just 16 minutes of all out just as fast as you could oh lord and it was miserable and so yeah i I, doing this first show and and showing up in the condition i had the photographer that that did the photo shoot with me he was like you need to come to sacramento next month because you will place very well it will be a bigger show and i was just like i can't i can't do it (laughs) yeah i know those feelings I am going to go eat an entire pizza tonight and I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to eat an entire box of Krispy Kreme donuts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, I was just that. I ate all the food. Yeah, you know? all the foods. It wasn't long after that we went to Oregon and I saw my par- my parents and they had a big barbecue and I ate all the food there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, it wasn't long after that that um, they have this little fair here called railroad days and they had me in the local paper here and and you know had my pictures in there and and you know you know put a little this lady calls me up out of the blue she goes i want you to do a, a little a, a little health and 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 you know exercise talk at, at railroad days and i was like oh okay well crap i gotta get in shape again because <laughs> by that time i'd already put on like 10 pounds you know 10 or 12 pounds something like that in how long and so boom it was probably a month okay okay my show is in june and railroad days is always in august so okay. it's probably about a month um but yeah l- luckily i wore it pretty well you know it was kind of one of those things where i was so depleted from just always going down 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 with calories that a lot of the food just kind of seemed to kind of fill me up again mm-hmm. but again i was i was right back in, made my menu, mm-hmm. started following it to the letter, you know, and I did the little, the little, uh, uh, talk at Railroad Day. Um, and then, yeah, and then I was ready to do it again come New Year's. And I went through, through basically the same approach and I did two shows in 2000 and that was, I think, four, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, what ended up doing the show that the guy was trying to talk me into doing in, in Sacramento. Um, same thing. I just showed up diced and, um, actually lost the overall to a very well-known natural bodybuilder by the name of Leroy Perry. That was the first time I met Leroy Perry and uh, lost in the overall to him in Sacramento. And then we went down to San Diego and I competed down there and um, learned what it meant to not be able to get full. (laughs) Yeah, That I mean, not in food wise, but I had been dieting for so long with a, basically a suboptimal approach of just never having high days never cycling nutrition, just always, always, always in low calories. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get a pump. I could not get a pump backstage. My veins were flat. My muscles were flat. And even the peak week plan that I had used up until that point, it was not working. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I was like, I'm missing something here. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So uh, you did 03, 04, and I know the guys that said that like 08, 09 was when y'all all met backstage at a few shows and stuff. Was there one in the middle? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there okay. was. A couple of five off. Okay. It's all. Um, still was training, you know, because I, I owned the gym. Um, was under the illusion that I could probably, you know, get my body weight up to 200 pounds and still be shredded. <laughs> uh, Don't we all think well, that? Like, 
I think I got up to 205 or so. I, that was my mission. In 2005, I was going to be 205. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, I, looked, I looked miserable. And your stage uh, weight is what? Just for context. Of you. 158 to 162. Oh. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't wear fat well, you know, especially because <laughs> it all resides right on my midsection and my back, you know? Um, so I competed again. I took 05 off and I competed again in 06. Now, this is when I met Jeff Alberts. Okay. Where at? And I actually made a, a, a video on this uh, on YouTube. Just a, It was kind of a little, just a, um, I think it was like a, a little 3DMJ Origins video. But I did the same approach in 2006, a little bit more lenient on my, my food choices. But um, there is this little show in Chico, California. And I found it online. I don't even remember the name of the organization. It was like the the... I don't remember. It was WB something something. Uh -huh. And went there to do that show. And um, there was three lightweights, one middleweight, one heavyweight. So there was five total competitors at this show. <laughs> did, they, did they leave y'all separate? They put the three lightweights together. Uh -huh. And then the middleweight and the heavyweight, they just did it solo. Oh, wow. They were bound and determined to have weight classes. <laughs> And, uh, so I, I met Jeff. Jeff started talking to me. I was kind of shy, you know, and up until now, I had, you know, basically came to every competition and, and, and dominated, you know, and um, so I was kind of shy and I, I didn't, you know, really say much. And Jeff was this really open guy that was just talking away. And what? Jeff? Different. Yes. Very different than what you would think. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's super different than what I would think. Very mellow, very, uh -huh. you know, just Jeff Alberts. But he was the one really talking with me. Interesting. Really nice. I just remember thinking, God, this guy's really nice, you know. Uh -huh. And so we go do our weigh-ins. And the the lady there says, I don't, you know, care what you weigh in, but you got to, you know, take your shorts off. So Jeff takes his shorts off, and he's got these huge <laughs> legs, these huge legs. I mean, made mine look like, you know, little sticks. They look like I had crap popsicles. <laughs> Um, and he, I'm like, oh, well, I don't have to worry about him. He's a middleweight, you know, I, I'm weighing, if I'm lucky, 160 pounds, he's got to weigh 180 and I'll be damned if he didn't get on that, on that scale and he was 161 and my jaw literally dropped. I was like, no way does that man weigh 161 pounds. And I got on the scale and I was 160 and a half. Uh -huh. And that was a very, very eye-opening experience for me with, with natural bodybuilding, how, um, you know, body makeup, build, bone structure is, mm -hmm. has a lot to do, you know, with how you look. Just one whole show, of course. Um, there's three lightweights. I think I got last. I think I got third. Okay. Um, and and that, was, that was my my first contact with Jeff Alberts. And I mean... My, like I said, Je Jeff had this jaw dropping. I think mean, at the time I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know about symmetry, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 you know all of those perfect connection points that need to happen, you know, in order for a body to build to be really, really good. Uh, I just knew that he had something that I didn't, you know. Yeah. Here's the funny thing is, so I, I, I compete against Jeff and 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 one other guy in our show one weekend. Two weekends later, I go back to Reno to do a, a show there, another INBA show, and I won the overall. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of, you know. So the, is that when you got your pro card? That is not when I got my okay. pro card. No. So that was an amateur. Small show. There was only, I think there was only 12 or, 12 or 13 competitors. So even though I won the overall, yeah. um, in fact, I won that, if I can show you, sword right there. You know, and that, that speaks volumes, like you said, if, if you have your best condition can come in last and first two weeks apart, depending on who shows up. And that's why I get, um, I'm sure you get it all the time too. And they're like, well, am I, am I okay? Will I get like top three? And I'm like, I, I just can't promise that. You don't know who's going to come, you know, it might be a Jeff yeah. Alberts. So Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Those two shows were literally two weeks apart. You know, and um, it might have even been one week. I don't know. They were they were right close yeah. together. I know that. Um, so, yeah, that was 06, 07. I competed in the NPC, got fourth in the show there, which was big, 
-huh. That was really big. I remember just being as elated for that uh, as I did winning the overall. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 08 is when I met uh, um, Alberto. That was when he won his pro card. Um, I actually lost to him at a show in Sacramento, which is now known as the Muscle Mayhem. Mm -hmm. um, I was a middleweight. I won the middleweights. He was a lightweight. Um, he won the lightweights. We went, you know, kind of at it head to head for the overall. And uh, he beat me there. Um, and then two, that was in July. So it was basically one month later. I traveled to Washington um, and, and competed in a WNBF show there and won my pro card in that show. It was about one month later. So, okay. so oh, wait. Yep. Okay. And so awesome. you've. Damn, that is a lot of seasons back to back. And did you know any different, or do you think this is how it goes? This yeah, is just... I, I really didn't know any different. I mean, my coach Skip Lacour did it. He did like twelve or thirteen back to back to back, okay. you know, years. Um, and so yeah, I ended up doing oh six, oh seven, oh eight, and oh nine, wow. all back to back because I won my pro card in oh eight. And at the time, the WNBF had a a rule where you had to compete as a pro within twelve months. Of winning your pro card um and so then i turned back around in 09 and went ahead and competed at the the u.s cup the wnbf u.s cup okay as a heavy <laughs> no way wow 165 pound weight <laughs> yeah how funny yeah there was i think there was 12 pros and they just split it right down the middle you know and so sean clarita was at that show um Jeff's brother, Paul, was at that show, Paul Alberts. Um, and so, yeah, there was a bunch of guys that were like 150 and less. And so they just split it right down the middle, 155 and below, you're the lightweights, 156 and above, you're the heavyweights. And I had to stand on stage next to Robert Peacock and uh, a shredded guy by the name of Kurt Widener. <laughs> okay. Who were both 190s. And, uh, Jeez. yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my first pro experience in 2009. <laughs> huh. So how long, uh, when did you finally break that streak? So 09 was when you took a big break then. Yep. Yep. I took, I took 2010 off. Um, we all competed together in 2011 because we'd started mm -hmm. 3d muscle journey at that time. So, um, Jeff and Alberto and I, uh, we competed in 2011 back in Kansas city. Um, that was, yep. um, Chris Foss was in that lineup, right? Gosh, you know, I don't know, Andrea. It could have been. Because I think, uh, like, right before that was my first show. Or no, right <laughs> after that was my first show, and he's the person that got me into it. And and it was like, he was going to do this KC show, and I was going to do, and we were both going to do this NPC show in Oklahoma. And then after the KC show, he was like, I'm done. I can't. And I was like, what do you mean? Because I didn't know any different. I'm like, you're done. You said you were going to do it. And he's like, no, I just know that I'm done. Just like we all now know what it means to be like, I know that I'm done prepping. Yeah. You know, but I was like, what? You're bailing out. He's like, no, I just, I just can't. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. 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 yeah I, that's interesting. I didn't even know that. Cause it was, it was a big lineup. That was a big show. Uh -huh. There was, I think there was 12 or 13 heavyweights yeah. and there was, there was 12 lightweights, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, that was a humbling experience. I got either last or second to last. I think I got 11th or 12th. Um, and of course, Jeff got second. Uh, Alberto got fourth, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was a humbling experience. That was like the first time I was like dealt a, 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 a losing card. And, and it was kind of a, it put a sour taste in my mouth. Um, Interesting. I did get, I, I, I kind of got a little bit of, um, I don't want to say revenge. What's the word I'm looking for? But just a little bit of redemption, I guess you might say. Because later that year, I competed in the Natural Olympia uh, in Reno. That's mm -hmm. where they used to have the Natural Olympia for the PNBA. And I got ninth out of 10 there, but it was really like my all-time best. And that was when I was kind of starting to figure out, you know what, this, this natural bodybuilding thing is not about placing. You know, it's yeah, really it about can't be. against yourself, you know. Yeah. Um, and I was okay with ninth out of 10 because I was at my best ever, my leanest ever, my heaviest ever, because I had actually been following a little bit more you know science-based principle and yeah i mean i was on stage with kiyoshi moody oh, and uh, justin figueroa mm -hmm. and uh just some really big monster guys so i was okay with with ninth out of ten you know where do you think that that shift happened from you doing the whole like this is my menu 
and you know skip liqueur style which at the time was the style right and into Mm -hmm. what y'all did as 3dmj like when is it like you guys all met and you kind of knew the secret everyone didn't know about flexible dieting or or did you Uh guys kind of come together as bro dieters still and not it was how did that it was a slow evolution it was a slow evolution uh, cause Oh four, you know, kind of keep in mind, I, I had the same approach in Oh four that I had in Oh three. Here's my menu, remove half a scoop of VB two from this meal, remove three ounces of chicken from this meal, you know, on down until, and I kept track of my calories and everything, but it was just always the same thing. I'm deducting 50 calories when I take out this scoop of VP two from right. this meal. Now my daily calories are no longer 1825. They're 1775, you know, right. um, and so, yeah, it was about 08, it was okay. either 07 or 08. And what basically started happening, Andrea, is I was like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore. I, I figured out on my own that, you know, there's 100 calories in three and a half ounces of chicken, mm-hmm. you know, 20 grams of protein, no, no carbs, essentially no fat. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I can have this turkey breast, you know, or turkey slices or whatever. They're, they're the same. Mm-hmm. So I started basically taking the same food calorie wise out and inserting stuff in that was the same calorie mm-hmm. wise. Right. So I was still following their approach, but I was, you know, I was like, I'm getting tired of broccoli. I'm taking out broccoli, you know, and I'm going to put in its place green beans or, you know, whatever, right. you know. So I started just basically subbing like for like out, but different foods, mm-hmm. you know, because that was, what was killing me and why I didn't want to do bodybuilding in 05 was that entire menu approach. So that was about 006 or 07, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe maybe it was even 2008. Um, but it was still like, I'm eating six or eight times a day. Yeah. <laughs> Never full, mm-hmm. you know. For and so years. I think it was, That's so crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. It was like that. And that was why I always rebounded in the off season, you right. know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was 09 when I, I, I'd already watched Alberto's, you know, prep and we were now we were on the bodybuilding.com form. So now, you know, social media is not what it is quite yet, but it's getting there. Right. And this so, is when it was like Eric Berto had worked with Lane ish. Right. So he was kind of on the cutting edge of his science. And yep. Yep. Okay. yep. And so okay. That, I kind of start to learn about flexible dieting and, and, and read about it. And so in 09, I kind of did a, a hybrid approach where I did flexible dieting like the first, I think, 20, it was like, I think it was like 16 weeks. Uh-huh. And then I kind of was, I was skeptical about it. You know how bodybuilders are. Yeah. Like, I don't know about that. But if you I know, really I got, am, put that broccoli am I gonna in, it might help. This time around doing this, you know, so yeah. then I switched to my menu approach for uh-huh. the last few weeks. And yeah, it was, it was basically... I think it was all of 2010. I just followed flexible dieting. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Eric, was it, I guess it was Lane, right? The kind of that brought Berto and Eric into that whole, that whole mindset of counting macros as opposed to calories and cups and half grams. Yeah, I'm, and... I'm, I'm 90% sure. I'm 90% right. sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because um, Alberto hired Lane in 08. Right. Um, and then Eric had hired Lane in 09, uh, along with uh, Eric's uh, longtime friend by the name of Adam, uh, hired Lane as well. And he did both of their preps for all of 2009, um, at least except I think like the very last month of, of Eric's prep in 2009, Berto took over. Right. And because um, basically Eric. Right. And because then from then on, Eric's getting his degrees and upon degrees right now, starting in 09. Yeah, he's getting his all his certifications and all that stuff. Okay, cool. It was a slow evolution. It started out replacing chicken with turkey, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, why drink your calories, you know, when I can chew up an egg white omelet that's the Uh same as a scoop of EP2, you know? Yeah. Uh, So yeah, that was kind of what started the evolution was that subbing out foods. Okay. Did you start coaching um, bodybuilders right away? Because I guess you guys met each other, and within about a year, y'all had sponsored athletes, right? And then immediately mm-hmm. went into. Okay. Yeah. Cause my first competitive season was 2003. Right. And I started coaching people in 2004. Oh, um, it I had no idea. Okay. 
was a lot, you know, and it was because I owned a gym. So uh-huh. I just had one or two people that were interested in it. Uh, coached a gal and, and two guys in 2000. And I coached two guys in 2004. Uh, coached a, a, a gal, a gal and two guys in 2005. Mm-hmm. Uh, coached a couple more people in 2006, seven, I think, six, seven, eight, something, something like that. So it wasn't a lot of people. It was just people at the gym, you know, people that yeah, were a little bit more still- curious. Out of uh, out of all of us, I mean, you started coaching bodybuilding way before, yeah, uh, before three yeah, DMJ. Yeah. Okay, I feel sorry for those people now. You know, <laughs> well, but you, I'm sure, knowing you, obviously, that was the best in- information that they had at the time, and so you exactly did, yeah. at, at the time, it was the way you did it, it yeah. was like, well, if you're a bodybuild, this is how you do it. Make it up. Here's your menu. You know, mm-hmm. every week we get together. Okay, you know what? Weight's looking good. You're looking good. We're going to deduct this from that meal and this from that meal. And, you know, let's go train, you know, essentially you're just taking macros. I mean, it's yeah. pretty much the same ish thing. Just yeah. 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 You're just, instead of, instead of saying, we're going to go from 200 grams of carbs to 175, we're going to, you know, take away an apple from this meal. You yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so when did, yeah. uh, when did, uh, powerlifting start? Was it completely after the whole, uh, 2011 year? Like, when did you start powerlifting now that you're such a good power? I started power powerlifting in, um, in 09. Okay. Let me think about that. Because what <laughs> actually, yes, I'm pretty sure it was 09. I'm pretty sure it was 09. Because uh, Alberto and I competed in 08. Uh-huh. And early in 2009, Eric had started his prep. And by this time, we're all talking on the, on the forums. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and Eric had a powerlifting meet that he was doing, an APA powerlifting meet. I think February of 2009. Okay. And I was like, I got to meet these guys. These guys seem like the coolest dudes. And we got together. I, I loaded up Xander and my, my Yukon and we drove down there one day and we watched a powerlifting meet and it was Eric's. Eric's was doing the powerlifting. Meet. Uh-huh. And I remember so vividly the place was packed because it was in a place called body tribe gym. So it's actually in the gym. Yeah. Stan Efforting is there. Stan Efforting is First time I ever squat somebody, I saw somebody squat over 500 pounds. He squatted like 775. <laughs> um, it was fun. We had a blast. My son is running around. He's got my cell phone. He's calling me on his, on, I don't even remember how he was doing that, but he was calling me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, he was having a ball, playing around with the other kids. He'd watch some lifting a little bit. He was only like, see, that was 09, so he was six, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, awesome experience. I absolutely had a ball. I come back and I, I'm telling my wife about it. I'm like, yeah, you should have seen it. There's even this little gal that was like 50 years old that squatted 65 pounds. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, hell, I can do that. That's it right. Wasn't I forgot Jamie she did. Started. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I trained her at the gym, got her all, all coached up on the commands and everything. And she was actually uh, the first one in, our, in the Loomis family clan to compete in powerlifting. She did a... Um, I might even have the thing around here somewhere. But yeah, I wanna... I've seen it at your house. That's I remember uh, seeing the picture of Jamie. Yeah, yeah. It was like a, a USPA, maybe USPA. Anyway, uh, she um, competed there in Grass Valley, California. Mm-hmm. And I think it was oh, later that year in October that I did my first meet. Uh, mm-hmm. Same same place that Eric did his earlier that year in February. Body Tribe. That was the first place I saw a meet, too, was at Body Tribe. And I think about a week later, I was like, as soon as this figure season's done, that's what I'm going to do. Same mm-hmm. thing. And uh, did you always, did you find a love that was like pretty much equal to the bodybuilding or was it kind of, well, this will do on the in-betweens kind of thing? Did- exactly. My okay. mindset was this is something to do in between bodybuilding seasons. Okay. Yeah, it really was. Um, and it was, it was basically because I thought, well, you know what? I'm never going to be as good at powerlifting as I am in bodybuilding, you know? Funny how um, that Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it, I, I, I'd say that probably started happening about probably 2000, probably 12 when I started making that switch. You know what I mean? Where it was kind of like, this powerlifting thing is a lot more fun. <laughs> now, do you think that the, because I mean, whether you're bodybuilding or powerlifting competitively, you still train your big three. Do you do, do you train all that much different, not so much, right? No, not too much. Not too much. I mean, obviously, like right now, I'm not doing a lot of, of training 
um, you know, in the 12 to 20 rep range, you know, but to be honest with you, I never did anyway. Yeah. I guess what, I mean, what I'm getting at when you say this is more fun, do you mean the competitive experience? Yes, like, exactly. Okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. The competitive experience is, in my opinion, it's, it's, you actually have control over your placing. And so that is a much better feeling. You know what I mean? When, mm -hmm. when you can, you can kind of get an idea of what your competitors are doing, at least if you know that you're competing against them, you know, if they're in the same weight class and whatnot. Um, and then you can basically say, you know what, there's, there's no way that I'm going to be able to pull that 550 pound deadlift and get first place. But I can go ahead and pull a PR, which I'm pretty sure I can get and settle for second. You know, right. um, that is a very empowering thing when up until that point, it's, it's kind of like a beauty pageant and you're standing up there hoping for the best. You yeah. Know? You're like, I hope they like me. Yeah. Pick me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, so, you know, God, the objectivity the of it is a relief to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. like it's just not being judged so much. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I have a, a weird question for you. If you, do you think that if you hadn't won your pro card in bodybuilding, because before then, you're, as, a, as an amateur, I mean, you swept most of the time, you know, your top three. And then mm -hmm. do you think that if you um, had placed just as well in pros that you would still have that same feeling about powerlifting versus bodybuilding? What do you think? Yeah, boy, that's a, that's a good question, you know. Because um, I think about, like, Jeff's desire for power, I mean, for bodybuilding, mm -hmm. you know, how he's, you know, he, he, he gets this thirst for competition, you know what I mean? And, and he, he really has to, to kind of weigh it, weigh it out a little bit, but he's like, he, he gets this thirst for competition and, and he's going to go, you know, and maybe it's a little slower approach, you know, maybe it's a little bit smarter, but nonetheless, it doesn't matter if it takes him 20 weeks or, or 50, he's going to do it. You know, and I think if I was in his shoes and I had his um, structure, his build, his same everything that he's got, if I was basically Jeff Alberts, um, yeah, you know, I it would be awfully hard to 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 make a switch from bodybuilding to powerlifting. Yeah. You know, um, when when you can when you can show up to almost any competition and and be kind of that guy. Um, gosh, I, I you know, <laughs> I think back to my amateur days, uh -huh. you know, and I think back to having that same kind of a thirst, you know, where it's like, I just got to work hard, put in the time, and I'm, I'm probably going to show up and, and, and do really, really well, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think that I would have, I don't think I'd be in the same shoes. I would probably be Jeff Alberts and I probably would be thinking, you know what, I'm going to start dieting next month. I'm going to do this show, you know, and I'm going to take that money that I win from that show and I'm going to pay for that show. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my troll, the world championships, you know, yeah. my, I my run, my run at the world championships. I think I would be a very different athlete. Because I always, I just find that interesting and it's like you don't know, chicken or egg, you know, does he, does he chase that so hard because he's so great at it naturally or, um, or vice versa kind of thing, you know? Um, and the same with you in powerlifting, did you, did you love it as much as you do now when you weren't at placing as well as you are now? Um, I think the love was a little bit different. Okay. The love was kind of, the love was because it was so much fun. You know, okay. you, you, you showed up and it was a workout party. Everybody there trained. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was cheering each other on. It was, it was just a lot of fun. And I remember the, the first powerlifting meet that I did in 2009, I was like, I'm going to do three or four of these a year, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and now it's, it's, I don't need to compete as much. You know, I'm, I'm pretty content just, just competing once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it's, it's a little bit more tangible as far as improvement goes. You know what okay. I mean? Last year when I competed, uh, 
for the first time in USAPL, I totaled 12.23. That's a tangible number, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when I showed up later at Raw Nationals, I totaled 12.49. That's a, a, a quantifiable improvement. And when you're a numbers geek like me, that's much more attractive than saying, well, you know what? I lost at this show, but then I turned around two weeks later and I won at this show. Right. Yet it's the same dude. You know, my placing was better, but was it really a quantifiable improvement? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, with the with the pros, when your placing is always going to be at the bottom end of the stack, how do you quantify your improvement? Well, this is a much better package than last year. You looked bigger. You know, maybe your legs weren't quite as lean or this wasn't quite as lean, but overall it was a better. That's very subjective. You know what right. I mean? And so I think the love of powerlifting is now. You know, I've got a tangible, quantifiable improvement. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just set a, a PR yesterday, you know, basically doubling what I did the last time I attempted this. That's quantifiable. That's improvement, you know, and I think that's what I'm really enjoying about powerlifting. Okay. So from what do you think like the next five years look like for you as an athlete? Good question. Good question because I don't even know that really, to be honest. <laughs> okay, with you. one year. <laughs> uh, immediately in the indefinite future i'm doing a powerlifting meet here in about two weeks um kind of my choice i, I want to have options um in 2015 I, I by my silver medal placing i automatically was qualified for raw nationals in 2016 in the 74 kg class so that's 162 ish 163 pounds mm -hmm. that automatically qualified because you have to qualify to go to raw nationals. Mm -hmm. You have to put up a qualifying total that is at or above their, whatever the qualification is in order to go to raw nationals. So I'm competing at this meet in two weeks so that I can uh, qualify in the upper weight class, which is the 83 kg weight class. Mm -hmm. So that way, and that's going to be really no problem when you're an old guy like me, <laughs> The qualifying total is here. I could walk in there and, and get here with my openers. You know what uh -huh. I mean? Um, yeah, I'll have options. I'll be able to, to compete at Raw Nationals in either the 74 kg or the 83 kg class. So that much is certain. Right. And that's June, right? Raw Nationals? Raw Nationals is in October. Uh -huh. Right around my birthday. Which that's one's in I June? Remember. There's something here in Texas... Maybe it's Worlds. Worlds. I okay. have Worlds. Okay. I'm crazy. That's what I would have gotten invited to if I would have won the gold. <laughs> ah. um, but, yeah, that's that's definite competition aspirations in the immediate future. Now, to be honest with you, do I really – am I going to Raw Nationals, um, you know, in hopes of qualifying for IPF Worlds or, um, you know, second place? I, I just recently got an invitation to something I didn't know existed, the North American – Oh, yeah, yeah. It's out of the country, right? Yeah, yeah, it's in Virgin Islands. Right. Um, so, yeah, you're saying you, 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 when you get a silver medal, you have international options. Mm -hmm. uh, I chose not to do that, you know, basically because of the travel expenses and family and, and other, you know, uh, scheduling conflicts. Um, but I want to do Raw Nationals basically because of the good experience that I had last year. One of my major decision making points with this was if I go to the Virgin Islands and compete in the the North American championships or whatever that was, I'm, I'm barely going to know anybody, you know, whereas raw nationals, especially with social media, it kind of almost at its peak right now, you, you, you get to meet so many different people and I'm going to get to see those people and talk with them, you know, in a, in a tangible uh, way that I won't get that. Uh, and that's really the reason I, I want to do raw nationals is to get that interaction again. And of course, being a competitive guy, I get my competitiveness, on as well. <laughs> hopefully, we won't have any big mishaps this year. Like we. Yeah. No. You no. Know, on the on the platform. <laughs> yeah. For those of you listening or watching, if in case you somehow missed it, uh, you pulled a PR deadlift, and then passed out on the platform in front of it. <laughs> PR deadlift. Put the weight down. Stood back up, and then. <laughs> and then crashed backwards. Oh yeah. my god. Um. Do we have a video of that on our channel? Five. What's that? Is there a video of that on our channel? It's not a video. Um, I got, I have, well, I have like seven eighths of the video. Okay. So, I know we got screenshots of it from somewhere, but I don't remember where. 
Yeah, it was actually Eric because okay. the the uh, the event was uh, streaming on bodybuilding.com. Okay. And so Eric Helms, our very own Eric Helms, was the one that made that that screenshot. <laughs> you know, I think it was nine frames of, of Brad going down. <laughs> and I still laugh at it. I look at that last picture of one foot is pointing out. <laughs> I, I just turn to the side. Just I am out. I am totally uh... out. And I do have the very beginnings of it. A client of mine was filming it from mm-hmm. the side at the top. And I got the whole lift, put it down. And then I stand up and I go like this. And then he, the video gets turned <laughs> off at that point. So, But I do have on my vlog. I've got like the video and then screenshot, 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 etc. Yeah. So, but I mean, if you're going to pass out, that's the that's way to the do way. it. Yeah, that is sure <laughs> the way to do it. Um, so what, what about bodybuilding? You alluded to this at the beginning. Um, you have some interesting feelings about your competitive future. Mm-hmm. Will you tell mm-hmm. me more about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not going to say that I will never do bodybuilding again. Right. So, going to say that i've learned it you know multiple times never say never um because i will say that the prospect of all five of us you know you jeff alberto eric and myself possibly you know doing a show together you know obviously you're not going to be up there with us you'll be doing you know either figure or bodybuilding or heck of you you bikini at some point who knows but (laughs) I don't know. That prospect is awfully enticing, you know. Um, and even if you choose that 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 grit is your thing, and you're never doing another aesthetic cosmetic sport again, I couldn't imagine that. The four of us, you know, yeah. Eric, myself, Jeff, and and Alberto, possibly gracing the same stage as competitors. Um, I would definitely suck it up, and and, and you know, knowing full well that I'm not going to place well just do it for that experience because I mean, that's a, that's a once in a lifetime experience, you know, maybe uh, twice we could try. But yeah. yeah, that would be, that would, I think that would be the one exception really, to be honest with you, where I would get, I would definitely get on the bodybuilding stage again. And believe me, you know, I'm, I'm not going to half ass it, you know, well, yeah. uh, I would try my best to get at my all time, best condition you know i i wouldn't care if it took me 65 weeks uh to get in the condition that i wanted to i would do my damnedest just to basically go out with a bang for for lack of a better term you know maybe i can get that that same conditioning look only maybe i'll actually hold on to some size this time and be at an all-time best you know brad loomis because trust me my physique's looking a whole lot better now you know than it did four or five years ago. So well, shit. You looked great on the stage, what, two two years ago? Was it twenty fourteen? I think, yeah. Yeah. And if I can get that kind of size again with my old level of conditioning, just be a little bit smarter about, you know, my, my final stages of prep, um, regardless of placing, I'll be pretty happy. And then just to have that experience in the pictures and, you know, the the video and the feels, you oh, know, of feels. having all of that together. You know, that's, that's something that would definitely, you know, make me break down. <laughs> well, do you, um, career wise, like you said, you're, you have the most athletes that you've ever had, mm-hmm. but, um, and you still have your other job as an x-ray. What's the official title? I'm actually a CAT scan tech. I'm okay, a CAT dedicated scan tech. CT tech. Yeah. I don't do x-rays anymore. I, I run the CAT scan machine okay. and it's just part-time. I just do it two times, you know, basically twice a week. Um, and it's more so for, you know, we don't have health benefits and I've got yeah. a 13 year old boy that plays football, you know, I've got to have health benefits for him, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, obviously with our company being so young, you know, we don't have that, um, you know, we, we can't provide that for ourselves yet, right. you know, so do you see do you see yourself coaching forevers and evers? You know, that's a good question. You know, I, I I think I could keep doing it, to be honest with you. I don't know if I'll ever get burnt out on it or if I get tired of it, but at least we can kind of control our our um, our valve, so to speak. You know, we can allow for more athletes or mm-hmm. maybe back a little bit like Eric had to do, you know, in conjunction with his PhD. He just couldn't he couldn't do both, you know, as much as he would like to have. Yeah. Um, I think the real question is, is will I stay relevant? 
You know, will I be, because I, I know education wise, I'll be good. You know, mm-hmm. I'll be able to coach people with the, the science based approach that we've got. But the other side is the experience side of it. You know what I mean? Um, will I be relevant? Will I be known? You know, will people know who Brad, Brad Loomis is and that he was, you know, once a, a, a pro bodybuilder and, and would he would I want him to coach me? You know, um, I think that's really the true question, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, outside of that, where, where's career going to go? I don't really know, to be honest with you. I'm not really sure. You know, I've, I've got a, a lot of great ideas in my, in my head as far as writing books, you know, with all the information that we're learning and, and, you know, I just don't know. Yeah. I'm not really sure where to go with all of it, you know? And, and yeah. so I guess, I guess that's a big question mark is what are we going to do, you know, <laughs> when 60, 70 years old and, you know, these 20, 30 year olds, you know, they don't want some 70 year old dude coaching them. <laughs> you know, a lot of my gals, you know, that, that, that send me, you know, physique updates. Are they really going to want to send physique updates to a 70 year old man? You know, what's he with those pictures in his spare time? <laughs> oh, how funny. I know. So I know it's so funny. I forget how weird it is that, that that happens until I'm sitting in Starbucks and I'm like mm-hmm. looking at clients and I'm like, I realize that everyone behind me sees my computer screen looking at like half naked people and I probably look like a pervert. Yeah. Like, I forget yeah. about that. Like it's so normal to me, yeah, to have, yeah. you know, it, exactly. You know, and it's, it's totally, it, it's, it's all in professionalism, you know, yeah. we, we're, we're evaluating the aesthetic uh-huh. look of a, of a person. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that could be easily misconstrued by just a <laughs> passerby that's looking at our, our computer screens, you know, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's such a good question. You know, will I be doing this when I'm, I don't know, you know, yeah. I really don't know. Um, yeah. What, what, uh, a, I'll just, what's the, what do you love so much about coaching bodybuilding versus personal training? Like, um, what's your, like you said, now you have like a fire, like no other with coaching, although the competitive bodybuilder in you is kind of dwindling just a little bit for now. Why do you, um, why do you think that 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 you are so attached to the sport? What did it give you, kind of thing? Like, what do you? Well, you know, I'm an extrovert, and I love talking with people. Mm-hmm. And when you start getting that extrovert who loves to talk with people, talking about a subject that's common, you know, between the two people, and then the two people have that same common love on that same subject. Hours can go by in a matter of minutes, you know, it really can. And you really don't even have to talk about anything pertinent, you know, it's just Mm -hmm. when you're talking about that subject, um, there's a genuine love that happens there, you know what I mean? And I kind of get to experience a little piece of that multiple times a day, you know what I mean? And when you're, when you're, Maybe not t- talking like you and I are here. You know, we get to have that probably at least, at least I get to have that at least once a day. Mm-hmm. There's very, very a strong parallel between seeing the vlogs of my athletes that come to me and then me making a vlog in this very spot to them. There's this this trade off of information. Um, yeah, and it's it's I think it's just because I, I really enjoy the interaction, you mm-hmm. know, with the athlete. Um, and yes, I did get that interaction with, with folks that I used to train at the gym, but it's, it's, you're teaching a, a beginner, um, kind of the same thing over and over and over again. When you squat, you have to sit back, you have to break at the hips. When you pick up a kettlebell, you start with the hips, bend the knees. It's, it's the same repetitive thing. Whereas with the, the, the athletes, they already know all of that. And so it's a lot more custom, you know? Yeah. Uh, they already know the movements. This person, you know, has been training for three years. Um, they're going to get the most benefit out of this type of a program, out of this type of an approach. And I get the privilege of, of divulging this information to them and seeing their excitement, you know. Um, and then, yeah, getting that interaction with that athlete versus an athlete who maybe has got 20, 30 years under their belt. That approach is something that really they they could not benefit from. We need to go with this type of an approach. We need to, you know, measure things a little bit, you know, more minutely and, and, you know, have cycles run differently and use this approach with this athlete. And then, of course, everybody kind of in between as well. 
Yeah. Um, that's what I'm really, really liking right now. And, and just seeing people's joy in learning, you know what I yeah. mean? They really, really like, Oh, you really, I, you mean I can have chicken or egg whites? It's the, <laughs> you know, that yeah. joy that comes with that. And then of course, when you get an email that, that came back from a person, say, you know, 16, 20 weeks down the road, I love this program. It's changed my life. I'm, I'm, you know, can't wait until the next mesocycle or macro. That's, that's the icing on the cake. And I think that's what I'm really loving about this right now. And I find what's so interesting too, that we get the privilege of doing is a prep is so internal and so life changing almost every time. Like you learn your insides real well, you know, how you feel, um, emotional changes, family, you know, everything is, it's almost like people give you like their diary, like their inner, you know, um, it's different when you're in a gym and everyone sees it than when someone's in a room like you or I having their little bit camera set up and being like, this is what's really going on in my life. You know, like I feel like they're all our friends, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe even deeper than our friends because you know that they're going through some shit, especially at the end of prep, you know, the things that they go through internally and you're like, they're, they're everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a very intimate relationship, yeah. you know, and, it's it's certainly on a different level, but it's 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 almost the same kind of level of when I used to coach my my Pop Warner kids, you know, in football, or even like when I when I coach my son, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's different. It's a different level, but it's very very similar, you know. And when they when they get heartbroken because of poor placing, you know, didn't get their expectations as far as their conditioning goes, it's heartbreaking for you as a coach. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what scares me with the popularity of coaching right now is that, you know, do people realize there's a lot more than just macro tweaking and, and adjusting, you know, training routines? Are you as vested as you should be, mm -hmm. you know, in that client? Because that's, that's kind of a stressful thing, you know, yeah. and, and it, it's something that you really, I think when you get into the, the, at least I know for me myself, I didn't expect that. Yeah. You know, I didn't expect to get that intimate with the person and that um, involved, you yeah. know. The last um, episode if, with Bert and Jeff, that was exactly, like, the art of coaching was what we went into. And it's, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we kind of expressed that, too. Like, it's it's scary, the lack of, um, or just the, the underestimation, I guess, of often of online coaching because you think, well, I'm not in person, so it can... It's almost like when it's when things are online, a lot of people think that it's okay to not be as personal. And I feel like it's, I don't know, just as, if not more, because they're in there. Again, like, you know, the vlogs are always someone in their room with their little phone being like, all right, coach. Yeah, here's the exactly. <laughs> and they're, and they're going to tell you stuff that they would never tell. Their husband even. or their wife. Exactly. Yeah. Their spouse. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's. I don't know. I, I guess it's just like I told you that that person in me that loves talking about a, a common interest, you know, uh -huh. um, that that I really I take that very seriously and I really, really enjoy that. You know, I totally I think it's just the empathy in me, you know, th that uh, um, God just naturally kind of placed in me. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, it's 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 something that that is if you were to tell somebody that or if somebody was to tell me that. You know, when we first started coaching, I would have been like, oh, wow, do I really want to do this? Yeah. You know, because that's that's something that, you, you know, you had better take seriously. And I don't really know if I could do it any other way, yeah. to be honest with you. You know, um, and, and, and on top of that, you know, it's I mean, we're almost everybody that does this. They're 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 competitive people, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's always this this balancing act of letting them be as harsh as they know they want to be, but yet at the same time, not letting them do the stupid things that we've done. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's always that too. You know, there's that, you got to be that, that coach that says, you know what? No, that's dumb. And then at the same time, you got to be that same coach that's going to grab the face mask and say, what did you do? You know, and, and yeah. that tough love, you know, and, and, and yeah, that's, that's something that, um, I've gotten better at, and I think it's making me better and better at what I do. Yeah. I just want to say thanks so much for, like, what you bring to our table as far as what, what I love 
and so unique about you. And you kick yourself in the butt for it sometimes. I don't know why, but you're like, I'm just so, you just, you always look for the best in people. And you've always been so um, optimistic about intentions and you just want good for everybody. And I think, you know, like you said, it just, whatever it is inside of you, it's so uh, compassionate, empathetic. And um, I know that when we do like our 3DMJ check-ins, every time that I have a problem or whatever, you always come back with that amount of, that's, that's part of it. We can do it. We move on. We so I just, um, on a personal level, I want to acknowledge you on behalf of like the other four coaches that, that you definitely are appreciated in that regard. And it, it means a lot. And it's, um, we love that about you. And you would say like, I'm so damn naive. And I'm like, no, but you I need I need someone like that in my life to see the good uh-huh. when I'm down, you know. And so I just want you to know, like that that coaching style that you just obsessed about um, helps me every week when I see your replies to my check in. So I appreciate that. Well, good, good. I'm I'm glad that I'm able to do that for you. You know, that's I guess that's just the Catholic in me. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like God said first and foremost, you know, love me above all others, and then love everybody else. You know, and it's it's just. I don't know. It's kind of one of those things where it's not up to me to question that, you know, because sure, it's easy to say, well, so-and-so pissed me off, so I'm going to shove them out of my life or whatever. But it's, it's, he said it, and I'm going to suck it up, and I'm going to do it, you know. And so that's, that's kind of always my first inclination is to mm-hmm. do that, you know. And then, of course, where I take it from there is, is my decision. So uh, I'm glad that that shows because yeah. I take that very seriously. I take that very seriously, you know, and I try to teach that to my son and, and my wife and as much as I can without Bible thumping, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless of, of all that stuff, it's just uh, refreshing in a world where that's not common. You know, most people are looking for the worst, you know, and most people are on the defense and you've always been one to, um, and I see it with your athletes and I see it when you're talking to us coaches that you're just open-minded and, and whenever we have problems, you say, well, this problem is because you, you have such high standards and that's just, you know, I just like how you coach us every week. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Well, thank you. No that, problem. That, is, that, that has made my day for sure. Well, good. So, made my day. Is there anything? And you know what? Okay. I got I to gotta turn around. I got to say okay. thank you. You know, you are providing stuff for us that I know me, I would Andrea, I would not know even the first inclination to do what you are doing, you know, for us. And, um, yeah, you know, that's, you, you've, you've earned a hundred percent of my trust, you know, and even though I may question things and I might think, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't shoot for the stars right now, or maybe we better just be a little bit cautious. You know, it's kind of at the same time, it's like, you know what, you're the man here. You're the one that's <laughs> got the the knowledge and you're the one that's got the the, the plan, the big plan. And I know you're not going to lead, lead us astray. I know it, you know? And so, um, I, yeah, it, you know, props back to you and, and thank you for that. Not a problem. And my, my biggest thing, we're making it happen, right? My podcast was the big, or the big thing now that we're, we're making happen together. So yeah. thank you for that. No problem. Is there anything, nope. huh? <laughs> no way I'd have been able to do it. <laughs> no we are doing it. I may, I might've been kicking everyone's ass into it, but we're all doing it now. So yeah. um, we are doing it. Is there we anything that you in particular on your episode would like to, uh, to let everyone know before we, we end this one and we'll talk to you in a week or two. But... Um, Any gosh, I don't messages? know that pretty darn that was good inclusive i can't think of anything else that i would add or take away really um perfect well um, it's been a pleasure that was fun that was shoot we got started a little bit late but still hour and 20 minutes of brad loomis yeah didn't seem like that (laughs) (laughs) well thank you guys for listening and we will see you all next week bye 